Hello. Hello. Fresh? <laughs> Boozers and shakers, we have a really exciting announcement. We're going on tour in 2020. Again, it's Yay. new and improved. We even have a tour name, which you will he- be hearing soon. We have soon. a tour logo. A logo. Oh my gosh, things are going to get really wild. Also, you've heard us say it before, but our this tour is going to be so different uh-huh. than last the last tour. So if you've already been to a show, it's not going to be yeah, anything like the last one. We're raising the bar. Yes. Uh, the bar, so to speak. Um, also... <laughs> And most importantly of all, if you are a patron, you get early access to tickets. So sign up at patreon.com slash ATWWD podcast. And by December 2nd, which is Cyber Monday, you will have access. You have a code and you'll be able to buy tickets before anyone else. How fun is that? And then on December 4th, we have a regular presale. And so if you follow us at ATWWD podcast on social media, you can get the code there. And December 6th is general uh, sales. So then everyone can have fun. But until then, Cyber Monday on the 2nd and then presale on the 4th. Um, New name, new logo, new tour. New me. <laughs> same me. New year, new us, except 2020, same us. <laughs> but a new show, for new sure. New show. And hopefully we'll get to see you guys uh, in 2020. We can't wait. Yay. Yay. And that's why we buy tickets to the show. Please. Uh- All right. All right. We're here. Episode 146. Woohoo! We did it! The big 146! <laughs> that's what I've always wanted. Like, hello, <laughs> that's the number. Fresh. Okay, we are here. Um, We are back. Uh, We've filmed two or recorded two episodes last week. Now we're back for another two. So, back yes. to back. Um, You probably just heard a little promo, unless you're listening to this, like, way far in the future, but... We're going on tour again! Yay! Yay! And if you're on Patreon, guess what? You get special, special access. Yay! Which we were so excited. We didn't put it in, like, originally, because we didn't know if it was possible. Thank God. Someone made it possible. It wasn't, (laughs) I was going to say we. We didn't do it. No. Somebody did it. But um, if you're on Patreon, if you join um, soon, got to kind of get on it. But if you join, we're going to give you a special promo code to get early access to tickets so that's kind of really exciting yes we had we got the green light to be able to let you guys Woo-hoo! know where we're where we're going and all that so yes these announcements are coming soon for like actual shows um we're announcing all the cities at once which is great oh that's so much better we're already like a step a thousand steps ahead as of uh which will be nice when we break even from all the horrible things that will probably happen <laughs> right. by accident. there might be things that go wrong but so far uh things are looking up um yeah so that's exciting yes do you have any announcements? Mm-mm. Okay, good. Because I do. Um, <laughs> I wanted to say thank you because now it's been two weeks since I made my big complaint on oh, to yeah. all of you. And I want to apologize for being in a less than stellar uh, mood or, I don't know, attitude that day. And everybody's been really kind to me and I appreciate it. And um, nobody was like, you're being such a complainy brat. Or maybe they were. I just didn't see it. But um, I really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone, for your kind words. And, um, yeah, I just it made me really happy. And I was like, thank you. And then someone wrote, why is everyone pitting Em and Christine against each other? I'm like... Because we hate each other. I was like, finally, Jesus, how long do we have to tell <laughs> you guys? Finally, someone saw what was happening there. But so then there was the Empire. People still were like, well, Em's still my favorite. I was like, okay, yeah, I get it. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I like so. my loyal listeners. Thank yeah, you. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but... Uh, so i was like you have the empire and then a couple people threw some things in there was christine i like that one well there's some really good ones pristine oh my god question on that was by sierra um this one's interesting x team schieffer that's pretty good yeah they're all good by captain cuddles then there's um (laughs) this one's good the christening (laughs) wait that's the one i think by lieutenant han then there's christine dumb Christine, like kingdom yeah sure christine um by murder road pod and then this one is my personal favorite the christine chapel <laughs> whoa they're like that was by uh Amore dg but they were I like actually love that because you're a work of art and I was like, okay and we worship you <laughs> okay now i don't love it okay empire you literally have something like the byzantine ottomans had so <laughs> leave me alone i get a chapel Anyway, so thank you. Also, one thing I wanted to clear up real quick before um, we get started is that uh, on a recent episode, we talked about how Renee loves Shrek in a, like, a sexual way, and a lot of people thought that meant 
Renata, my mother. Oh, no, two different people. And they were like, wow, your mom's really... And I was like, my mom doesn't even know what Trek is. Like, no, please, God. And also, if she was, don't kink shame Renata. No, like, they were No, they were like, wow, cool, your mom. Oh, and I was oh, like, oh, no. I was like, I'm all for it, actually. No, I'm not. I'm not for my mother, like, <laughs> sexually idolizing an animated children's character. Sorry. Everyone's, everyone's got a thing. It's okay. No, Renee has that thing. Not everyone's got that thing. Re- uh, Renee is a blast. Renee is a friend of ours, not my mom <laughs> to be clear there's renee and renata different people yeah only so, one of them is interested in shrek that we know of that we know of and although renata might be converted by the end of this probably series. not because i if i have anything <laughs> to do with it <laughs> we're going to avoid that um at all costs i texted her do you know what shrek is and she's like yes and then just like That's never all... but if you texted renee do you know who shrek is <laughs> Some really X-rated things would come back. No, she would know better. (laughs) She knows I would never speak to her again. Um, So that's all. Anyway, I just wanted to say thank you to everybody for being kind on social media. That was very um, warmed my heart a bit. And um, yeah, you still have a lot of favorites, but that's okay. Yeah, I'm glad you had your two weeks. I got some. Everyone will come back to me. I know. I got a little minute of some love. So thank you, everybody. Um, And that's all. Uh, I I have a random life update that means really nothing to anybody except me. And your whole empire? And the empire. Mm -hmm. Um, So I became friends. I didn't become friends. Hang on. (laughs) Um, So in college, there was this, uh, I was in like a, like a group of, I had my like squad and. Dear God. And one of them at one point said, oh, have you ever heard of Rat Master, the Rat Master? And I was like, no, I don't know what that is. And Rat Master ended up becoming a thing that you know we talked about a lot in my group and then i ended up bringing home uh when i was on break basically there's there was this guy in our college town who uh was a aspiring rap artist who let his left everyone his phone number like just through word of mouth people would get this phone number in their phone and you could call him at any time and just pick a random topic and he would freestyle rap a song to you and then just hang up as if he was dropping the mic and I texted my friends recently and I was like, do you remember Rat Master? Because I was looking through my old phone and found, yeah. my, I found in my phone Rat Master. And I was like, oh, wow, I've got to like ask my friends if they still remember us ever calling him. Because we used to call him all the time. We would ask about like, we'd pick Pokemon or Waffle House or, and he would just tell you the best rap you ever heard about Pokemon. Like before Venmo. So it's not like he was even probably getting paid for any oh, of this. Oh, it's totally free. Oh. This was back when we had flip phones. Oh, that's um, not fair. You had a flip phone in college? Yeah, I didn't get a flip phone until I met you in Boston. A flip phone? Or I didn't get an iPhone until... Yeah, Blaze didn't get an iPhone until he met me either. I don't know what my... what I think I just wanted to Snapchat everyone. <laughs> well, yeah, I had a flip phone in college. But uh, I... I had a Blackberry, so why am I even talking? I'm like, I didn't have a smartphone either. Okay. Anyway, I was looking through my contacts. I found Ratmaster. I reached out to my friends, and I was like, do you still have remember this guy? And they're like, I kind of remember him, but I remember him being really good and like wanting to tell everybody about him and then i totally just like forgot about him um until i found his number and so i was like i bet i could find this guy like catfish is a thing i have a phone number like i'm just gonna go figure out who this guy is so i found him on instagram he actually never went by rap master just through word of mouth and like the game of telephone people called him <gasps> rap master or at least that's the name i knew him as but he apparently goes by a totally different name and um i ended up finding his instagram and dming him and saying, like, you were such a, like, a great rapper, and, like, my friends and I loved you in college. And I found out he lives, like, a half an hour away from me, and no. we're going to go get drinks. In L.A.? Yeah. <gasps> Shut up. So we're going to go get drinks he, next week. Is he, does he, he still rap? does it. Oh, yeah. Let me give everyone his number. He's still, Don't, like... His number? Oh. No, like, the number public. that... He, yes. The, so you oh, can... Well, I don't know. You can call him at any time, and he will send... Give you, like, the... Is he okay with this? He's fine. You're... He's okay with... I'm gonna... Tens of thousands of people calling him all the time. He has 25,000 fans currently that call him all the time. Oh, on, and, and on his Instagram. It, maybe just give the Instagram so they can go follow him. I mean, on his Instagram and in every post, he leaves his phone number. Oh, just call okay. Me. All right. So I'm going to... Uh, I just want to shout him out because I remember him being like so, so much fun in, in college. Okay. His uh, Instagram is called Press Play Hotline. Okay. Oh, wait. I'm looking this up too. And his... Uh, his phone number is 205-617-9166. Press play. He has 2,000. You said he has 25,000. No, no, no. 25,000 oh. people have, like, 
Like he, there was some article that came out about him about like how many people have called him and asked for random raps. But in all of his texts, in all of his, uh, this is so cool. In all of his posts, he says either text me or email me or call me from that number and leave a topic and you'll, I'll like make you a track. LOL. Text me your email today and I will send an unreleased. Okay. So maybe text him. Text him. Maybe don't call him because. Maybe he's too big now. I, I don't know. know. I We used to call him all the time and it was fine. But shoot him a text if you want a random rap creator. This is so wild, you. dude. Oh my gosh. I want to call. But I, I why just. Why don't we call? We got to call him. Okay, we can call him. Oh my gosh. This is so cool. But anyway, him and I are like buds now. So the press play hotline. Hell yeah. And he said if we ever do a show in LA, he and his wife want to come see us. Oh my gosh. So full circle. VIP. Anyway, I've talked a lot about him. I just wanted to give that guy some free promo because I always thought he was super cool. Um, And that's it. That's my update. I'm getting drinks with someone that I. That's really cool. Was like a legend in college. I have noticed that about the podcast. It's kind of cool. Like the people you end up reconnecting with. Yeah. Where you're like, oh. They found me or they like heard about the show and were like, oh, I remember her and like, yeah, reached out. It's always really fun. Anyway, so I didn't mean to go off on that tangent, but it was just like this elusive mythical creature to me in college. I was like, if I just call, I just get like a custom. It, is a myth- it sounds like a mythical thing. It and I thought real. in my in my mind, he like just kind of vanished and they just was so easy to find. And I was like, hey, I really and like the your phone stuff. number's still open. I love that. Yeah. He said he's been doing it since 2006. On the razor, from the razor to the iPhone 11. <laughs> oh, I can see it now. Anyway, from pillar to no, Pro, from well, rapper. Let's hope not pillar to killer because I'm getting drinks with him next week. <laughs> yeah, so. well, we'll see. Anyway, um, I'll give you guys an update on how that's that goes. so exciting. I love that update. I had no idea. Um, yeah. Also, by the way, there are a couple shows where people have come up and been like, "You probably don't know me," and I'm like, "Oh my god!" Like I went to high, we went to high school, and I went to a very like small high school, and so just FYI, like. If you, like, know, like, you can always say hi. I feel like people sometimes will be like, I didn't want to, like, bother your DM you. And I'm like, no, say hi. I didn't realize how many of my fraternity brothers from college live near us. But we've done, like, three different shows and had my, like... To just, like, show up. And they don't even tell me. They just end up in the I VIP know. line. And I'm like, what the hell are you doing here? We're like, we would have, said like, <laughs> talk to you. Yeah, yeah we would so have anyway, met up with you. If you do happen to know me from some weird connection, I do know you. I, rem- I will remember you. Like, you'll be like, oh, you don't know who I... Oh, no, I know. And some of our uh, regular... Um, live show attendees why we've learned oh, yeah. to recognize your faces and, and then sometimes i'm goes oh we've met and they're like no we haven't and i was like never yeah. mind <laughs> sometimes I, sometimes it, we win it usually works sometimes we just look like idiots but <sighs> anyway so that's all but uh that's that on my anyway end. i have a story sorry for like totally taking up everyone's no, space there. you're good christine chapel is ready to hear your story <laughs> okay welcome enter so my story is uh one that i don't know how i haven't covered it yet i i just think it's a cool story and i never actually knew like the information on it someone wrote on youtube on your last it was the one the really haunted one and they're like everyone in the paranormal community knows about this how could you not have like they were mad and i was like you know we don't want to give out our hand right away like we want to save some big ones there are a lot of big true crime ones also i legitimately didn't know about that one that one just totally escaped me for 27 years oh yeah she was pissed which i don't know why i'm like now at least it's better that we do it now and we know more about what we're doing sorry you're mad but also like a lot of what am i gonna do about it i'm learning that youtube's dangerous because people can just comment what they're thinking right away whereas if you're listening to the podcast you can't like there's nowhere no forum except like reddit but you can't like instantly tell us what you think and it's dangerous because I will wake up to things like, Christine's fine, but... And I'm like, oh, <laughs> now I have to read it. And, and it's fine, except how did you not know this very obvious information? Yeah, or like... I don't fucking know how I didn't know. Or like, why don't they have a table in front of them and then like 45 people like it? And I'm like, I don't... I mean, as I'm holding my laptop, to be fair. Well, I know, but... But whatever. We had a, we had we a table for you. like 100 episodes and now we've got a green screen, so... We told you we don't know. We're trying our best there's we're gonna make it work it's hard (laughs) and if you like it awesome if you don't like it apparently you're gonna comment about it anyway so there's nothing more that any of us can do here all we want to do is please you and even when we don't we still keep showing up so no all we you have to at least appreciate our resilience we care about you so here's my story okay she was barking oh sorry i didn't even hear it well there's also children screaming outside oh there's always that all right, so here's a story that, for the people who were apparently going to complain, I did know about this. I just never thought to cover it. Okay. Um, but this is the story of James Dean's uh, car. Oh, hell yeah. Called The Little Bastard, which is what I call Christine. <laughs> really? I call you James Dean's car. That's so weird. <laughs> JDL. JDC. 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 Okay, right. this is exciting. 
So uh, it's kind of a quicker story, but I never knew all the information, so I'm excited to have learned about it. I'm very sorry. We had technical some technical. technical difficulties. Yes, I had to do some stairs. So let's just put it that way. We're back. Let's try again. I'm so sorry about that. Here's okay. a story of James Dean's little bastard. We're having a really... We're having a wild day. Yeah. We were supposed to have recorded both of them by now, and we're starting now. Yeah, we're <clears throat> uh, two bullets in. Yay. <laughs> yes. Okay. Let's just start over just in case everyone else... Just okay. Just so you're caught up. Um, so on September 23rd in 1955, a week before the crash, James Dean, who was 24 at the time, bought a 1955 Porsche 550 Spider which was the 55th of 90 of those types of car to have been made. Fun That's fact. pretty badass. Uh, he had George Barris personalize it for him after he purchased the car. And George Barris was a Hollywood auto designer. So he was the designer of the Batmobile. Whoa. And on the Munsters, he also made the Munster coach and the Dragula casket <laughs> dragster. You know, that, you know. You know that one. The car that I've always wanted. I, right. Our dream car. Um, so... His specific requests, not that this is necessary, but just to prove I did my research, um, James Dean requested tartan seats. He wanted Whoa. he wanted the number 130 emblazoned on the hood of the car, and he wanted Little Bastard painted under the Porsche emblem on the engine cover. And why wouldn't you, though? Uh, someone uh, called him or the car Little Bastard, and he just liked it so much, he I, just kept it. I like it, too. It's pretty baller. So, uh, later that, I don't know if it was later that day or within that week at the very least, I think it was later that day though. Um, later that day after getting the car personalized, he met up with actor Alec Guinness, who people mainly know as Obi-Wan Kenobi from the original Star Wars. Oh. Um, he met up with Alec to show him the car and he was bragging about, um, how fast it can go apparently has a top speed of like 150, nice. um, and was just like really stoked about this car and Alec Guinness said that he hated this car. He got a terrible gut feeling about it. <gasps> and even in like uh, a diary entry at some point, he wrote the sports car looked sinister to me, exhausted, hungry and feeling a little ill tempered in spite of Dean's kindness. I heard myself saying in a voice I could hardly recognize as my own. Please never get in that. <gasps> if you get in the car, you will be found dead in it by the end of, by this time next week. Whoa. And apparently James Dean laughed. Hilarious joke, by the way. But top notch comedy. <laughs> Alec Guinness wasn't the only person who felt uncomfortable. Apparently, anyone that came in contact with this car did not want to get in it for some reason, uh, including Dean's uh, James Dean's girlfriend Ursula. She refused to even sit in the car. James Dean showed the car to Eartha Kitt and Nick Adams, and both of them said that they hated the car. Wow! And at one point, James Dean responded to um, Nick Adams saying, "I am destined to die in a speeding car." Okay. Well, come on uh he's definitely manifesting something yeah. whether or not he knows it exactly um so george the designer he at least said he also said that the car gave him feelings of quote impending doom oh my god and the actress that played vampira um i think her name was mela nermi mila nermi um she would even left a note on the windshield of the car warning james to literally never drive it why don't all cars that are going to be in crashes give off these vibes that right. would save us a lot of trouble why, do, why doesn't anything that could one day potentially murder someone give you that honest vibe? to god it's like i wish someone would tell me if something were wrong with my car so it must have been some pretty bad energy for must have, for all these people and a lot of if another theory would be that if this car was possessed by something that's why james dean might have been so stoked about uh, it because it was feeding off of his energy and everyone else was like something <clears throat> is wrong everyone else hadn't been attached to the car yet <sighs> and they were like no get away it from was that. probably rejecting everyone else and it was like i only want jd <laughs> jd oh man um so a week later september 30th um james is with uh his friend I don't know how to say it. Rolf, Rolf Wutherich. What the? Oh. I have to say Wutherich. Wutherich. Is Rolf right? Rolf, yeah. Rolf. Okay. Rolf, um, I don't know. <clears throat> Rolf, yeah. So he was a former pilot and a uh, mechanic for... He was a mechanic for Porsche. And they were oh. at Competition Motors in LA um, preparing to go to uh, a car race later that weekend. With the car? With the car. Okay. So, Jane, I don't know if this is something that most people know, but James Dean apparently is like a racing enthusiast and he's actually been in a lot of races and has bought uh, speed cars before 
And so this wasn't like a, a new purchase. This was a new purchase, but it was he. This wasn't his first. This race wasn't car. like a shocking purchase or like a, right. a he, new hobby or he something. He was known to to race. Before. Understood. Okay. So he wanted to go racing that weekend in Salinas, I think. Okay. And um. Uh, so they planned to hitch the car behind his truck and go with a photographer and um their friend Bill Hickman, who was a stuntman. Apparently, he's been a stuntman in some big movies. Um. And Rolf suggested that James actually drive the car instead of hitching it to the back of his truck. That way he could break in the engine and it was kind of a far drive. So it would give him some time to familiarize himself with the car. Makes sense. Um, And then Rolf said he would tag along and Bill would drive behind them. So uh, James and Rolf and Bill all left for Salinas for the race show. And on the way, this is another um, part where people say that there was some potential foreshadowing. Where, on the way, uh, California Highway Patrolman O.V. Hunter uh, pulled them over and wrote Dean for a speeding ticket. Oh, my Um, goodness. Okay. And so he did that around 3.30 and gave him a speeding ticket for going 65 and a 55. Um, But because they were also... And it doesn't matter. It was 65 and a 55. That's not um, even that bad. No. And like but I've he, seen assholes in sports cars r- race through Hollywood at like right. 90 miles an hour. And that's how people die, guys. So he he got that ticket around 3.30. Um, and then later that night, around 5.45, another car was heading east on Route 466. Um, the car was a black and white 1950 Ford two-door coupe. And the driver was a 23-year-old uh, student literally named donald turn up speed sorry hold on what his last name was literally turn up speed how what ethnicity Very is that fortunate <laughs> uh so oh my god what donald was driving his car uh heading east the way that it sounded to me was the way i was trying to make it up in my head was that it sounds like Donald was turning left, like he was at an at an intersection, was going to turn left onto the road, uh, like crossing one lane to uh-huh. go onto the other lane. And James was driving that lane; he would have to cross over. So it. it sounds like as Donald was turning to get to start going east, um, James's car was driving too fast because at this point he already just got a speeding ticket an hour and a half earlier and now he is going 85 Uh on this road um and i guess donald decided to turn out onto the lane too early while james was speeding too fast and so Mm. knowing they were too close james tried to swerve out of the way (gasps) oh my god and they ended up having a head-on collision um oh my god the cars met head-on and donald's car slid almost 40 feet which is how powerful um james dean's car had pushed him yeah james was placed into an ambulance um rolf was also placed on the ambulance but he was thrown from the car so he ended up surviving rolf um, did? yeah okay he uh they both were taken to paso robles war memorial hospital um but james dean was pronounced dead on arrival mm. and donald turn up speed walked away with a scratch on his nose <gasps> oh my god so can you imagine being that like that being your that's like a turning point in your life that's like yeah. a defining moment yeah you You're gotta like, change that last name real quick real i mean quick woof so rolf survived the crash like i said but he survived serious head injuries but he really at the end of the day he was he ended up being fine after the head injuries and he only survived or he survived only having a broken jaw and a broken leg so everything ended up healing um, but he felt extreme survivor's guilt afterwards. I and bet. so they think that a combination of survivor's guilt plus his head injuries, um, are what caused him to later, um, attempt a murder suicide with his <gasps> wife. Oh no. Um, he tried stabbing her in their kitchen or with a kitchen knife and then later also attempted uh, suicide twice. Um, and all of them are apparently linked to his survivor's guilt. Um, wow oh i did not know that i mean that is i can't imagine traumatizing being in a car with and also being the one to suggest like we should drive the car oh yeah there's so much yeah yeah i and probably like you're in the car you're probably having a good time it's not like there's probably that feeling of like i should have known we were going too fast like oh god yeah i can't i can't imagine it yeah that's pretty i can't imagine the level of survivor's Mm -mm. guilt at all so tragic 
Rolf sounds like he ended up not having I... a super healthy after life of that. Yeah. Um, in 1981, he ultimately died in a different car crash. Oh, really? And in the same year, Donald Turnips being also died of lung cancer in 1981. So this was like 30 years later. They also died the same year? Yeah. Oh, wow. Did uh, did he stab his wife? Like, did he... He stabbed her and I think they both survived. Oh, okay. Um, I didn't look further into that. I just know that it that's was my a... side of the story, yeah. I guess. <laughs> I just know it was a failed murder suicide attempt. Wow, that's so fucked up. Okay. Um. So yeah. So in case people were wondering what happened to them, Rolf and Donald both died the same year in eighty one. Wow. Um. So what had happened was James's foot was crushed between the clutch and the brake pedal, and he was pinned under the car with a broken neck. Oh my god. And uh. They have shown pictures of what the car looked like after the crash, and it really was just, like, torn up tinfoil. Like, it, that car was just fucked up. Mm. Bill, who was following behind them, because um, remember, he was driving separately. Oh, God, he, can you imagine that, too? He appeared 10 minutes later on the scene. Oh, right, because he wasn't speeding 85, right? Right. So he showed up later, oh my God. found the wreck, and pried Dean from the wreck. Oh, my God. And Dean died in his arms. So there is the he argument. He hadn't died already? He hadn't died yet. <sighs> So I didn't see this anywhere, but I do know that people have said that if you see someone in an accident, never pull them from the car. Right. You don't know what you're... Because you don't know if you're going to like tug them the wrong way and then they're like... If your neck is broken or your back. Yeah. If you like, you might accidentally break their back and then they're also like if you have like a a knife wound or something and if you remove it, you don't know what you're... It might be holding... It might actually be lodging things in place still. Right, 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 right. Um, Wait for emergency personnel. So I didn't see this anywhere. I'm not saying anyone ever blamed Bill... Um, but I know I would have been wary to pry someone from a wreck with a broken neck and then they died in my arms. I would wonder if like I had assisted in that by accident trying to help. I wonder if he was, yeah, well, yeah. So I didn't hear it's any. It's hard also if someone's under a car and you're like, well, I'll just stand here. Yeah, exactly. Know? I mean, I, honestly, if I saw you under a car, I can't right, say right, I right. wouldn't pull you out. I would like to think my first instinct would be <laughs> let like me to help try you. and help. Yeah. Yeah. No, no fault to him at oh. all. Um, and what's also ironic is weeks before this crash, James Dean did a PSA on TV for the National Safety Council for safe driving, and his slogan was, the life you save might be mine. I just got goose cam. Goose cam. Holy smokes. I'd forgotten about that part. That is just extra, sin- like, creepy. So this happened at the intersection of highways 41 and 46, which apparently is now known as the James Dean Memorial Junction. Oh um and george the designer this is where he becomes the main character so james is dead but there's still this wreck to deal with so what happens with the car um so george bought the remains of the porsche for twenty five hundred dollars and some say probably to put it on display and exploit it in some way um and that i'm gonna get back to you later but the the main theory or the the main understanding that i found was that he bought the remains um for twenty five hundred dollars so it it does eventually end up in George's possession. I'm not sure how, but that seems to be the running mm. storyline. So when he did get the car, he put it in his truck. And when it got back to his shop, the car apparently fell out of the back of his truck and broke a mechanic's legs. What? So still... Still causing some still issues here. <laughs> problematic. Problematic. So George then started to just sell the parts of it and tried to sell the engine and the drivetrain to a guy named Troy and a guy named William, who are both racing enthusiasts. Okay. Um, And both of these people, Troy and William, ended up, next time they were racing, were racing each other using these parts that they bought from James Dean's car. Mm -hmm. Um, So Troy had the engine and William had the drivetrain. These two used their sold parts on their cars and ended up racing each other um, the next time they were on the track. And... During that race, Troy lost control and slammed into a tree, dying on impact. Oh, my God. And William's wheels locked up for no explainable reason, forcing the car to roll out, and he was seriously injured. Oh, my God. George also, and this is, it. I don't think George was doing this right away. It sounded more like, oh, well, here's this part that I'm not using anymore with this car. Right. Oh, someone's requesting, do I have one in the shop? I'm just going to sell it. You probably know enough people where it's like, oh, yeah, I have an... Like, right, you I know who extra. needs what. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially for a car, there was only, like, 90 of them ever made. I so mean, yeah, true. if you have one, you might as well sell it. Well, also, you're like, I don't want this. I'm like, right. this can break in everyone's legs. So, at some point, there was a guy from New York who was looking for two of the two tires um, for his car. And George had the two, car, the two tires left from mm. James Dean's car and was like, I'll just sell those. 
The guy put them on his car and in his first drive with the car, both tires exploded simultaneously, oh. making him drive off the road. But both of them went pap at the same time. Wow. That is re- that is very weird. It's at least weird. Yes. It's at least weird. Like it's not, I don't think that's a normal thing to happen. So at that point, George was like, I'm not selling any more of this car okay, to people. Well, that's good of him. So I'm just going to loan it out to the LA chapter of the National Safety Council and they can use it as uh, in their exhibit for safe driving. Oh, well, that's a good idea. Um, so while the car was being stored for the exhibit, the garage that it was being stored in caught on fire no. and everything except the car was destroyed. No. Oh my God. You're right. This is like a demonic fucking car. Apparently the paint was like barely scorched. You know who else is a demonic car? Who? Christine. You have a demon. Well, Stephen King. What? Oh, come on. Stephen King? No. What about Stephen King? Stephen King's book, Christine, is about a killer car. I thought you were saying you, Christine, have a haunted car. I was like, what the fuck are no, you talking Christine about? Christine is a haunt. I got Christine you now. Is a I got you now. Car. I got you now. Although you, you, you did, gotta read that book, man. You did say, you know who has a haunted car? Christine. No, I said, you know who is a haunted car? I see. It didn't make sense because. It didn't translate. Yeah, no. Sorry, y'all. Okay. That was a, a really failed attempt at referencing it Stephen King. No, it would have been a, a it would have landed if your name wasn't also Christine. I immediately went to like I've been in your. But car. that was why it was a fun fact because I was like, oh well, the only other reference I have. It was fun and it did land for everyone except me. <laughs> I, I was like, am I forgetting something? I don't want you to be discouraged. I'm the I I'm at that. fault here. I uh, I you, I guess you're not a huge Stephen King person, are you? I'm not. No, I am a Stephen King fan. I'm just not a reader. Oh right, so. right, 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 right. So the second Christine watch, becomes a movie, you like I'll watch, watch it. it. It is a movie. Okay, well, I'll go watch that. My mom was like, I named you, and then I didn't know about this movie, and then all of a sudden there was this movie, and it was like murdering everyone, and everyone was like, Christine, like the murderous car, and my mom was like, Oh, yeah, I'll watch it. that. I won't um, read it, but I'll watch it. I just, I'm sorry, I'm watching Castle Rock. It's very good. It's um on Hulu. It's about, uh, it's based That was recommended Stephen to us King. a long time ago. Yeah, I season two just came out, so I'm oh, watching season two. Yeah, it's very good. Anyway, very go cool. on. I'm sorry. No, you're fine. Derail. Anyway, the little bastard, aka Christine. Again, <laughs> something I'm. You're right. I'm. Not, I'm just putting two. You two called together. it early. Yeah. Uh, so maybe this actually is Christine. Wait, in hold on. A Wait a minute. I don't like this anymore. Christine is the little bastard. I don't want. Well, as predicted, full circle. My parents say it all the time. So uh, the everything but the car was destroyed in the That's fire. Creepy. The California Highway Patrol decided that they would host a different exhibit with the car. At a high school, but the car literally fell off of its display and broke <gasps> a student's hip. What? After that exhibit... That doesn't happen. Like, that's insane. Think about that. After that exhibit, the car was being transported from the exhibit back to George's house. And that, um, the guy driving the truck, the driver lost control oh and was God. thrown out of the truck. And somehow the Porsche fell off the truck and landed on him, killing him instantly. What? The car literally physically killed him. Like Final Destination. I, th- I was Somehow he got thrown out of the middleman truck and then the Porsche fell off of the truck wow. and landed and on crushed him. him. This and crushed is him. like Final Destination. Like you can't escape this thing. This no. Is- Why are people still volunteering to be around I actually, this car? I'm like, somebody probably just drew straws or they were like, yeah, uh, Bill can do it. And Bill's like, do what? Like, Nothing. <laughs> There's just some precious cargo back here. Exactly. Don't worry about it. Somewhat. I mean, George seems to be nowhere near these things. That's right. George got he out knows. quick. Yeah. So there, that was one of two fatal accidents involving the car being transported by a truck driver. And in 1958, there was another truck that was transporting the Porsche and it was parked on a hill and its brakes gave out and ran into the car behind it. And someone died? I don't know about that. Oh. I don't know about that. That's insane, though. I mean, this is like the like the statistics alone are wild. Just, yeah, for how many times? This is like, yeah, it's a statistics The question. number of people, you know, we're good at that, at math. Um, but yeah, the number of people connected to this who've been injured or killed is, I think, I would and like so to think. so consistently, because remember, James bought this car in 1955, and all sure. this has happened in the last three years. No. Oh, in the like three years after, like that? all of these incidences are happening within the last three years, of like, from James buying it. I see. Okay. To it, like the brakes failing and hitting another car. That all happened. That in was three 19- years. Oh my god. Okay, I didn't even realize that. So George saw. Uh, this is also during that time. George apparently saw someone trying to break into his shop and steal the car's wheel as like a souvenir of mm. James Dean's car, mm. and the burglar somehow injured himself in a way that isn't actually realistic and he ended up breaking his own arm 
what? somehow. So there's other weird incidents where if you even go near the car, you are potentially in danger. In 1959, the car was on display in New Orleans, and it literally on display just fell into a bunch of pieces, like just broke apart. I just, I mean, I would love to watch security footage of that thing just falling apart. <laughs> just like a bolt just like spitting right? out. Right? Oh my God. The tires like, explode. Like, this is crazy. So it was on another exhibit. Uh, it needs to stop going to these exhibits. I mean, why do people want these hello? on display in your place? A, a field trip already went really, really poorly maybe the first a, time. Maybe like an assistant really hated being at that exhibit and was like, I know just the thing. Like, let's just like <laughs> put a car here. No matter what I do, I'm going to look good compared to this car because it's destined to just fall apart yeah. at the seams. Oof. So anyway, it was on another exhibit in Florida in 1960, and uh, George had the car shipped back to L.A., and when he got it shipped back, he opened the trailer that it was supposed to be in, and it was gone. No. What? And the car has never been seen again. Wait, it's it's gone gone? Gone <gasps> missing, stolen, who what? knows? Someone had to have stolen that. George says that before he ever lent the car out to those exhibits, he always kept the passenger side door. I'm not sure why, but that's something that I read. Interesting. Um, so that door has been, is still around. That's interesting. I bet it. Cause you know, if you look in like a museum, like they have, you, so you can look inside, maybe yeah. they just took it off to have like, oh, you can maybe. look into the front seat. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Like Ted Bundy's car. Yeah. And they have the door moved. Yuck. Okay. Yikes. Also um, another haunted ass car. I, I bet Absolutely. Um, that one, dare I say, is much more demonic too. You th- yeah. That one has more sinister shit behind it. So other than that door, we, the car is just, <laughs> just gone great just vanished george says that it was stolen um out of a locked trailer out of a locked trailer um but maybe someone who was like responsible for delivering it like had a hand in it maybe maybe yeah who knows uh, yeah that's crazy wow. and other than that a lot of people say that james's family might have some of the remaining parts um but also it's pretty common that like on ebay and shit people will always be selling oh, like, part sure. of james dean james dean's car so you never know what you're right. and nobody knows where these parts went they don't know if it got stripped and sold yeah. or if it became part of another car just play it safe and don't buy don't, just don't try to buy looking. don't try to buy it <laughs> so many actually think that george just created this story so he would stop people from getting hurt and he wouldn't have to keep loaning it out to exhibit oh the story about the stealing not the story yeah. about everyone okay. no george so a lot of people think that george made up that it was stolen got it. and he's pretending that he opened the trailer <laughs> and it wasn't there <laughs> The people think he just hid the car and refuses to tell anyone kinda, where it is. Uh, it's not the worst idea at this point. No, it's really not. I it's feel actually like kind of noble of him to if be he like. He admitted that. I'd be like, yeah. keep it up. Well, and he's the one who's like putting the risk on himself too. Like, right? Oof. Who knows where that thing is? Also, if it, if places have caught on fire before with that thing in it, That's like, right? Yeah, really taking a risk there, leaving it somewhere. Totally. Um. So on James Dean's. 50th death anniversary oh fun apparently the volvo auto museum displayed a uh, the car's passenger door and the museum uh at that time offered a million dollars for the car's whereabouts really um 10 years later so james dean's 60th death anniversary sure. a guy named sean riley contacted the museum after hearing about this offer and he said that at six years old he his father brought him to work one day and Whatcom County, Washington? Whatcom? Well, I don't know. What, what com? Oh, yeah. Let's go. Whatcom what, what sounds right. Yeah. Um, so he was six years old. His father brought him to work. And he remembers seeing his dad and other men, including George Barris, hiding a wrecked car no. behind a false wall in a building. A false wall. Oh, we love a false wall. We love a good Come false wall. Come on. Um, George, you sneaky bastard. You sneaky little bastard. Hey. Hey, hey, hey. Sean remembers parts of the conversation he overheard, and he, uh, it seems suspicious, obviously. Like, oh, I was six. My dad's job that I don't know. Right. I don't know where I was except this county, and it's in a false wall. <laughs> right, and it's like, like a six-year-old's memory, like a memory from that long ago. And But he believes it well enough that he's passed polygraph tests that the auto museum has paid for. Um, because they want to see if it's true and wow. they should really look into. They should. They should. Uh, so Sean refuses to say where the building is until he's offered a larger reward. <laughs> oh, my God. And the museum won't actually pay him, even though it was originally a million dollars for the car's whereabouts. Um, they won't pay because, one, Sean can't prove it. 
Um, also, yeah. Sean doesn't own the cars or he doesn't own the car or the building. So the museum can't get permission from him to knock down this wall and see for sure if there's a car there. So there's really Somebody. no way to prove it. Oh, man. And um, they were hoping to exchange the million dollars for ownership of the car once they knew its whereabouts. And since Sean doesn't own the car, they wouldn't be getting anything in exchange except information. Yeah, they should have been a little more careful with the wording maybe of their deal, their offer. And apparently they want uh, proof first verified by George Barris knowing that he's worked on the car. So they were like, even if we found a car in a false wall, we don't know if it's the car you planted something. So they have a lot of caveats to their rule. But someone has come forward and said it's potentially in a false wall in Whatcom County. County, I wonder how many other people kind of made claims because for a million bucks... Like, yeah. this sounds like a legitimate, like, they followed through, but I wonder how many people are like, I have it. And they're like... Right. I mean, he at least passed a polygraph test and hasn't changed his story. So, so that's like, the... he at least... And and uh, George is keeping his mouth shut. He's like, it's lost. It's stolen. and it won't say anything. Wow. So nobody knows. Interesting. So here's where the um, the theory gets of where, how he, how George got the car is kind of tricky because I know I said earlier he bought the wreckage for $2,500, but it sounds like the Porsche, after it um, was signed out of James Dean's insurance and it was ready to be sold, yeah. um, there was a guy named Bill Etrich, Etrich, um, sure, who apparently bought it first for $1,092 and apparently his family still has the slip, like proving that they wow. bought this car before george got it so then the story gets muddled up of well did george buy it from bill um because bill says the one the one that bought this apparently right after the wreck bill says that he bought it and stripped out the mechanical parts and used it for his lotus 9 race car and he after he removed the parts including the engine and the drivetrain the rest of it went to a scrapyard in san fernando interesting okay so that's where george's story starts making less sense because if bill used the engine and the drivetrain then george did not sell those to those two people in a race car right race which is where ended up getting injured right and then the story kind of loses its yeah and also he he wouldn't have bought it from a scrapyard for twenty five hundred dollars george made it sound like he bought it directly yeah 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 but it if he got if george did get the remains from a scrapyard in san fernando he bill says the only things he would have been able to have gotten out of the scrapyard was the rear body and the right door and then he w- must have just put them on a different spider and pretended it was okay, the that, little bastard i was about to ask like then how did they put it on a museum okay yeah. I, I get it um so if that's all true then all this has just been a wild coincidence or a different haunted car posing as <laughs> the little bastard. Or somebody just put some terrible energy onto that thing anyway, just thinking like... Right, exactly. Thinking what it... Like manifesting that it was the original. Ugh. So Bill has said if anyone actually has remaining parts, then they have been verified. The authentic, the authenticity of the parts has been already verified. Okay. So you would know if you had a real part of the car. Got it. But so... It's confusing about did Bill buy it and then George found some of the leftover pieces and sure. lied about the whole thing or did George actually buy original parts? It's I don't know what happened. It kind of like dilutes the right the validity of this whole story. It becomes but, kind of like a legend almost. But that is the legend of the little bastard. Wow, I mean it's a terrible tragedy anyway. Like yeah, the story itself. That's Yikes. the truth. You know, I was at when for one of my birthdays, Blaze like called off work and took me to a surprise tour. It was like that murder tour. The true, remember that it was um like two years ago. It was like a dearly departed oh, tour. Dearly departed has great tours in L. A. Um, it's like this museum, and uh, I think that's what it was called. It was it's like about all the people who died, like ghosts and graveyards or ghosts. No, and- no, it's like one museum, and they do this tour. Oh. Yeah, and it's like the death not the death museum, but it's like Death in Hollywood or something and they have Oh, cool. like all the different stories, but they have like a whole display about the car and everything and I did not know all those crazy details. Um and all I the, don't know how accurate oh, that, Listen, that was the first three pages of Google, guys. So Yeah. No, that's crazy. But that was everything I found. How are your M&Ms? They're so good. And I've been staring at them for a while. Give me a green one. Yeah. Oh, two green ones. Oh, 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 oh. there's a puppy dog in here. Hi, no, don't eat the M&M's. 
Mm. Love a good M&M. Mm. You just watched me eat that off the floor, guys. Mm. <laughs> All right. Anyway, that's my story. Sorry, Eva. I need a break for a for snack. We should order food. Probably. Okay. All right. Now it's my turn. Um, now this is a kind of an interesting... Oh, you move this way. Make... It's a good noise. Hold on. <laughs> okay. Sorry. So this is an interesting one. Um, remember how I mentioned that I love Rainbow Kitty Surprise? Yes. And I'm going to... Or Rainbow Kitty Surprise, sorry. And I'm going to see them um, in March. Yes. Well, so I was like so blown away. I got a DM from their manager. Which, shut up. I know. Are you going to meet them? So, I, Well, I, I, don't, I don't think so. I... Listen. I'm trying to play it cool. Okay. But it's also not, their manager emailed it's you. It's not working. Uh, me playing it cool but I'm trying um, and she was like oh my god I can't like uh, I can't believe you mentioned the band like I was so excited to hear the shout out and I was like that's crazy and I was like I'm fangirling she's like no I'm fangirling and I was like no I'm fangirling you could anyway, totally you could totally if you're listening Christine isn't gonna ask but can you no, let her meet Rainbow Kid no, no, no 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 she said she do would, what you must no no she said she would bring me some merch and I was like I'll bring you some merch too, like a big Dorcas. And I'm such like, such a weird little she hodgepodge. She's like, please don't bring me stuff. I have to like travel, but I don't know. Maybe I'll bring her some koozies or something. I don't know. Anyway, it doesn't matter. But I was like very geeking out, as, I love you, it. as you can well imagine. Um, and so we were chatting, chit chatting. Um, we're we're Instagram, we're IG friends now. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so okay, here's the thing. She reached out, or and we talked, and she said. By the way, there's a story that, like, if you, you know, you should look into. And I was like, okay. And um, she said, there. so the Boone, North Carolina is where she's from. And that's where she met the guys from Rainbow Kin Surprise. They all went to school there. Mm. And she's like, they had a crazy murder there in the 70s. Wait, did they go to App State? I guess you would. Um, I don't know. But the, the, uh, the story that I'm doing involves that school yes yeah no boone is like probably one of the prettiest places i've ever been i've heard that and my stepdad's really like best friend is from north carolina i've only been a couple of times to you that know, area my cousin tanner yeah he went to upstate oh and my, my i like him one of my best friends cc went to upstate oh my god i'm also ig friends with them okay good <laughs> i'm also ig friends with my cousin christine so we're all winners today <laughs> but are you ig friends with my cousin that's the real question no no probably not no 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 um okay da 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 Anyway, so that's a good question. I didn't ask where they went. I, for some reason, I pictured high school. I don't know why. Gotcha. But they, it could have been college. Um, so this is the story of the Durham murders. Um, and here we go. So the Durham family moved to Boone, North Carolina in November 1969. And uh, speaking of cars, they moved there to open up their own Buick dealership. Oh. Which was like a dream come true for the family. They like worked really hard and they could finally like afford to open their own shop like their own dealership so this was like a very big deal to them uh the family the durham's consisted of bryce durham 51 which i did not know the name bryce existed in like the yeah, 60s bryce sounds like something that like mm, 10 years maybe before i was alive the sound was created and someone yeah. named their child that. <laughs> yeah someone accidentally like coughed and somebody created that name yeah it's kind of like they're like i can't imagine a kyle in 1920 isn't that strange yeah yeah and so i mean it's i don't i don't have a problem with the name i'm just saying it seems like a much more common name yeah. today than it would have been back then yeah. so i kept getting confused because the dad is bryce and i'm like it seems it like it sounds like he's teenage son like the name. teenage jock <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly okay well the teenage son's actually named bobby joe so well, interesting because i would think bobby joe's a girl's name yeah you know it's all sort of mixed up one of my babysitters growing up was named billy joe really yep virginia then, for you that's right <laughs> uh then again you're very genderly biased toward everyone so. that's true you have very strict rules about gender so I do. So. My my one rule is there are no rules. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, we are very strict about that. Okay. Ah! <laughs> oh my god. That fucking gay ghost that is haunting you just just destroyed. <laughs> are we going to die? <laughs> Oh my god, I'm so sorry. I haven't even been able to really like react. Are you okay, first of all? I'm good. I'm fine. All my pores are just sweating. Um, so I guess M just somehow tipped the table like with so much stuff on it. There is 
like caramel apple lollipops went everywhere there's definitely two large champagne glasses that were just like teetering there's like all sorts of candy there's like sh- every there's if you could imagine like a table that has so much on it that you could not put one more no. thing on it and so i put my feet on and it. there's also a lot of glass on it and then everything was top heavy towards my feet so everything just well and then i'm screamed loudly into everyone's ears so that didn't help either <laughs> holy smokes that scared everything, me it looked like it looked like this is really fucked up but i thought like the dining room of the titanic when like everything oh, yeah, sliding just slides one off. way it just i was i was Except prepared with your dumb feet <laughs> it was my my feet are the iceberg, the iceberg. <laughs> no i really thought there was just going to be shattered glass everywhere oh trust me i did too i thought you're i thought i'd have to call blaze for, oh there it goes em jesus christ i made it worse <laughs> yeah Okay, I won't put my feet on there ever again until well, next that time. that went interestingly. <laughs> to be fair, we both had our feet on it, and I think it balanced it out, and then I took mine off. And, I see, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. More, no more balance. Also, when you think about, like, the human body, at least with me, my legs are, like, two-thirds of me. Right, tarantula legs. So I really like to throw them on a table. I mean, I was, You're throwing I was demanding, like, 100 pounds of leg mm. on the table, and for the table to be like, this is fine. Tree trunk legs don't. If you took my legs away, I would literally be this tall. Like, it's amazing. <laughs> it is. And pretty. I'm like six feet tall, but I'm this big without legs. It's crazy. It's really. That's anyway. That's, that's how most humans work. But it just, I, I was going to say, I guess that's pretty standard. But yeah, you did uh, definitely just destroy the whole studio. So if I were a high person, that would probably be the thing I think about the most. Because I, I thought oh, about I thought you meant the table. I was like, no, the fact that my legs are just most of me. Yeah, I started thinking the other day about a lot of things about how if you were named if your name was a-l-e-x-a and mm-hmm. then that thing came out like all the times this happens oh yeah to people and they're like damn it like we came up with that name first and now it has this like other co-. anyway i started talking about it so along that someone was like are you did you smoke something and i was like no i just think about it all the time it's true i mean you really like someone said like this is gonna be the most beautiful named baby in the whole wide world and then like a week later yep amazon was like we've got this new invention <laughs> And also, it'll <laughs> yell at you all the time. Every time you say your baby's name. Imagine if you're like a 51-year-old man, your name's Bryce. Well, thank you. Also, imagine if you named your child Christine and then a car comes murdering everyone. <laughs> this is just tough for me, okay? My life's Full really circle. hard. Full circle. ABC. Alexa, ABC. Bryce, and Christine. Be careful. There's one in here. Okay. Um, all right. ABC. I get it. Anyway. Let's move on. Let's move on. Okay. Where are we? I uh, have no idea anymore. Bryce, okay. So Bryce, and uh, his wife's name is Virginia. What, V8? V8, uh, 46. So he's 51, she's 46. Their son Bobby Joe is 19, and their daughter Ginny, I think uh, Virginia, I see. maybe. Ginny That's where is I expect it's 18. From. So um, she's Virginia Jr. Yeah, which is interesting because it's not Bryce Jr., it's B- Bobby Joe, but you That's know, fun. what are you going to do? So a former judge in the area who became friends with them uh, later said, he kind of just showed up here. No one knew much about him. So mm. that's kind of the way the town was like, okay. Like, that's what Christine used to say about me when I just wandered into her <laughs> he apartment. He just kind of showed up. Nobody really knew what was going on. We quickly knew a lot about you, I just banged you, on the door and said, let's start a podcast. Your dumb legs came barreling on it. And it was like, oh, no. <laughs> the table hid in the closet. All right. All of my, my valuables will never be the same. <laughs> um, my valuables. There's like 8,000 Skittles. That's all that's on that table. Um, and a bunch of glass. And a bunch of glass. Okay, so that's kind of the way the town saw them. Um, It struck people as a little odd that the family was, like, pretty reserved. Um, They bought this, like, local business, but they weren't, like, super involved in the community. Um, And I think this was just, like, a very close-knit area. They were friendly. Like, they nobody had a real problem with them, but they kind of kept to themselves. So they've moved moved in. They've lived there for about 18 months. And um, the family had built, like, a small network in the town. And Ginny had actually married a local man named Troy Hall. So she was only 18 and uh, went, sorry. Well, that went well. Okay. Uh, She was only 18. um, And so when she married Troy. He who shall not be named. We're really cursed today. I'm not kidding. 
We've been cursed for the last, I think, three or four weeks. 20, Actually, 28 years? Oh, I was thinking. At like, least two months. Yeah. Realistically, at least two months. Like, I, right. Like, we're trying to play it cool, but like, man, guys, we've had a rough time. Mercury is like not only in retrograde, but like pissed at his girlfriend and yeah. like the girlfriend's pissed at him. And like, and, like we're ruled by Mercury. Mercury as lost his job. Like, a, Mercury is pissed Mercury's- off letting unleashing it all on us even when it's not in retrograde it's got all these other things going on and we have to deal with it i mean come on our lives are really hard sorry i know this is so obnoxious okay <laughs> uh, sorry so jenny was 18 she had dropped out of college and moved in with her new husband so her dad was like not thrilled about this so she actually dropped out of um appalachian state mm-hmm. App State, I guess, is what you call it. Yep. Okay. And uh, Troy was a student there. So she kind of moved in with him. And her dad was like, what the hell? Like, you're 18. Like, go to school. Don't get married right now. Or if you do, like, still stay in school. Like, he was just frustrated. Right. Uh, On the afternoon of February 3rd, 1972... It had begun to snow heavily. There was, like, this big storm rolling in. And the streets were already icing over. And Ginny's husband, Troy, was recovering from the flu. So she called her dad and uh, asked him to come pick her up and drop her off at home. So on the drive, apparently they had a serious talk about, like, his disappointment that she'd dropped out of school. Mm. And ultimately he convinced her to uh, re-enroll the next semester and try again. He dropped her off at the trailer where she lived with Troy, and uh, Bryce apparently seemed happy and was like, okay, I think the talk went well, and I got through to her, and he headed back to work. Fun fact, their trailer was located in the area behind where Boone's Walmart is now. Fun! So if you want to go take a little peekaroo, that's where it is. So that evening after work, Bryce left a rotary meeting, uh, picked up Virginia and Bobby Joe, and they headed home. Because of the snow, it took them uh, 20 to 30 minutes to drive the two miles back to their house. But since he had this car dealership, he was able to pick, like, a really sturdy four-wheel drive car to take them back. So they made it back around 1030 that night. Troy and Ginny were at their home listening to music when they received a phone call. Uh Uh-oh. I know. I already – like, I'm already spooked. This is why Christine has phone anxiety. (laughs) I know. That's so true. That's so true. Um, Also because of you. But – Yes. But also because of this. Um, So Troy – Okay, this is, like, already spooking me. I'm sorry. Uh, Troy picked up, and he heard a hushed, urgent whisper on the other end. It sounded like Virginia, his mother-in-law, and she whispered, Help, they've got Bobby and Bryce in a back room. (gasps) And then the line just went dead. So, Troy, apparently, the first thing he says to Ginny is, does your mom like like to pull pranks? Like, Well, that's a fair question. (laughs) Could this be, like, a prank? And uh, Ginny was like, she said someone is like holding her son hostage. No, like that's not a prank. Like right. my mother would not do that. So um, she's like, call, call back. So he calls back and the line is just completely disconnected. So they're like, holy shit, we have to head over there. So they jump in their car, but because of the snowstorm and I guess the temperature outside, the car just doesn't start. Like the engine just keeps turning over. And one of the couple's neighbors was actually a private detective named Cecil Lee Small. So they run over to his trailer. They bang on the door. They're like, we need a ride. So he's like, okay, here, get in my car. The three of them rush over to the family home to check on the Durhams. Uh, Small brought his revolver just in case. When they got close enough, they parked, and Ginny and Troy – no, sorry, Ginny was left in the car. Troy and Small, um, the driver, ran to the front door and rang the bell. There was no answer. They tried the back door, couldn't get an answer. Uh, They finally found the garage. The garage had like a – there was something wonky with it, so they were able to like pry it open. Uh, There's something wrong with the spring, and they went through a side entrance into the house. So the entire house had been absolutely torn apart. Every closet was open. Pictures had been, like, ripped from the walls. Drawers had been upturned. The phone had literally been ripped out of the wall, like the landline cord had been ripped out. They heard the TV on, which is just very eerie. So they headed to the TV room, like, cautiously, obviously. Just inside the doorway of the TV room, they found pools of congealing blood. And they were like, welp. Too Fuck. late. Yep. So Small hushed Troy and said, do you hear that? You know, they're thinking like, oh my God, someone could still be he- in the right, house, obviously. Right. And so they're like, do you hear that? It was a consistent dripping sound. Oh. So they're like, assuming the sink's running over, they... <laughs> Don't assume that. <laughs> assuming assuming the sink's... <laughs> praying that the sink's yeah, running right. over. It's more like that. Oh, blindly praying. Um, It wasn't the sink. Bryce, oh, this is really bad. Bryce, Virginia, and Bobby Joe were all in the bathroom, dead, 
Their fully clothed bodies had been draped over the edge of the bathtub, their heads submerged in the water. And the dripping was actually coming from, like, the overflow drain. So it wasn't actually blood, but it was, like, the tub had been so full, it was, like, still running, and the, the overflow drain kept, like, dripping back into the tub. And weirdly enough, there was not one drop of water on the floor. So that was strange, too. Uh, So still in shock, Troy called the Boone Police Department from a neighbor's house, and shortly after 11, investigators from the State Highway Patrol, the Watauga Sheriff's Office, Boone Police Department, and the State Bureau of Investigation all arrived at the scene with reporters close behind. The sheriff addressed the journalists, quote, this is the worst crime that I can recall here. We've had some bad ones, but I've never seen anything like this. So the autopsy determined that Bobby Joe and his father had been strangled and then drowned in the tub. Um, but Virginia appeared to have already been dead when her head was placed in the water. Okay. So she had been strangled, um, to death and then put in the water, whereas they had been strangled and then like ultimately killed by drowning, which is interesting why one was different than the other two. Right. Um, each victim had rope burns around their necks and there was still a short length of nylon cord around Bryce, the dad's throat. All three victims had been hogtied their hands behind their backs. I mean, it's really bad. Like I said, the house had been ransacked and some stuff was stolen. But oddly enough, there was like one of those things where on first glance, it's like, oh, this looks like a robbery. But then you're like, "Mm, maybe not. Because like they left an entire bag of cash on a dining room chair. Interesting. That like uh, the dad was going (laughs) to deposit the next day from the dealership like to the bank. And that was just sitting there with like several hundred dollars of cash in it. So that was odd um and like just random things like why were the pictures ripped off the walls if this was just a robbery just really strange stuff like that uh police were especially intrigued by the living room setup so like i said the tv was blaring um there were two full glasses and one half glass of coke on the coffee table there was a half-eaten portion of baked chicken next to the half-empty glass and the rest of the kitchen was found sorry the chicken was found in the kitchen uh, there were also several rows of playing cards on the coffee table. And so Ginny, they like asked Ginny to explain maybe what this setup was. And she was able to explain. She said what she thinks was happening is that or what had happened was that the family was watching TV. Um, Bobby had probably been served his food first. So he was already sitting there in the living room. Uh, he ate some of his chicken and drank some of his cola. And uh, she said the cart and the, the parents were probably still in the kitchen getting their food ready. She said the cards were definitely his because, uh, quote, a couple of weeks ago, he decided that he was going to finally beat Solitaire. (sighs) Yeah. So uh, oddly enough, too, the Durham's beloved family four-wheel drive car was not in the driveway, uh, so police suspected it had been stolen. Unfortunately, because of the heavy snowfall, any prints or tire tracks had already been covered up. Um, Just before midnight, police heard from a man who had actually found the car It was stalled in a ditch along a rural road heading toward Boone. Uh, The engine was still on and the windshield wipers were moving back and forth. So, like, it's just kind of abandoned with, like, the engine on, the lights on, windshield wipers. It's just empty. Super eerie. Very eerie. Yeah, in the snow, too. Um, He said there's no one inside. He told police he saw not a soul in sight, no footprints near the vehicle, nothing. In the back, they found a pillowcase stuffed with several silver, like, platters and, like, silverware and that kind of thing. Um, and tire tracks behind the truck indicated that another vehicle was following. So the people probably just like jumped out when the car stalled and hopped in the one behind them. Got it. Um, based on the evidence, police determined that the intruders had arrived in their own car, which they parked out of sight down a dead end road. Then they made their way to the door, um, by foot entering the house and overpowering the family very quickly. Excuse me. Somehow Virginia was able to call her daughter's telephone and uh, say a few words before the phone was ripped out of the wall and then she was strangled to death so they were thinking maybe that's why she was killed immediately that way rather than you know taking the time to drown right 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 right. um a motive at first they couldn't really figure out Uh, some people were convinced that this was like a deep-seated revenge thing because it was so violent and so brutal and like almost execution like the way that they were tied up like that. Yeah. It seems like it's all very systematic. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. And like the fact that it was all three of them, it wasn't like there was one target. It was like the whole family. 
just very weird um it seemed personal it seems personal too that someone <laughs> took down all of their pictures and shit yeah yeah it was like too like someone hands hated, on. hated the whole family yeah so that was a lot of people were convinced that that was what was going on um others were convinced this was just a crime of opportunity and that after um one of the durham's was killed by accident or by you know the f- they started fighting and maybe like one of them was killed and then they said they didn't want witnesses and maybe killed the other two um that didn't totally make sense too because it was you know you could have just killed them without all the right the with the whole process right like all the the drama like the bells hanging and them upside down and drowning them yeah and- all this crazy um so yeah so that was another theory um either way the community was obviously shocked this was like horrific uh after the crime the sale of locks and firearms skyrocketed i guess unsurprisingly one family even moved out of the area and said they would not return until the killers were apprehended uh within a few days the community had collected a ten thousand dollar reward for any information leading to the arrest and conviction of the attackers and actually within a few weeks they had four men apprehended after stealing from a local store and they were like okay i think these guys might be the ones but they um interviewed them and were released pretty quickly because there was no evidence to support that they were the ones who Mm. did it there was just nothing to hold them at all right and it didn't make much sense so unfortunately that didn't pan out but um theories continue to circulate one popular theory was that the durhams had been murdered after bryce revealed the ringleaders of a car dealership scam in surrey county that involved like rolling back the miles on the vehicles and then selling them to customers as like having a really low mileage, but they had been, like, you know, Ferris Bueller-ing it. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah I got you. Uh, you know, how it's uh, professionally known. <laughs> um, this theory, however, didn't, like, there was no su- supporting evidence for that. Like, there was, nobody could find this shady supposed ring. Like, it was just a rumor. Got it. Like, nobody could find any activity of this or, or like, any proof that this there actually just, it happened. It just didn't exist, it seems. Yes, it seemed got to it. be just, like, a rumor um bryce durham himself was like pretty straight laced he had no like enemies that anyone knew about never had any like criminal behavior in the past no run-ins with the law um it didn't seem like he was involved in any criminal activity and when they searched his business and everything there was nothing shady going on so that was another kind of debunking the theory um one interesting thought is like because of the military precision of the crime like the way they were tied up the way they were like systematically brutally murdered um, a theory briefly was floated around that the Green Berets, uh, the U.S. Army Special Forces, were wow. involved. And that's because that Rotary meeting is actually the Green Berets were there giving a demonstration. Um, Interesting. A, like a skiing demonstration. And they had like the same kind of nylon rope, but it, it was a pretty common type of rope. But sure. some people thought, well, maybe that has, they had some falling out at the meeting with or... all of the green berets <laughs> yes just like, yeah they just like happened during a ski instruction like i don't i don't know really pissed them off during the ski instruction <laughs> listen i've been pretty pissed off in a ski instruction so <laughs> i will tell you do pizza not french fries i know, pizza, not french I know. Fries. bunny slopes can really get you going <laughs> um, so that theory was vetted too but like ultimately again there was no supporting evidence of that the military was involved or like why they would be Um, Over the years, more than 200 people have been interviewed regarding the case, but 47 years later, the case still remains cold. It is unsolved. Mm. Interesting. The Watauga County Sheriff's Office and State Bureau of Investigation periodically run fingerprint searches to see if they can match. So they found fingerprints in the home, like latent fingerprints, but they've not ever been able to link them. And they're still running them every now and then to see if like it comes up in the database and they've never been able to match it to anyone which is pretty wild to me because I'm like, you'd think that after that many years, someone... Who, someone would have, would have done something. Right. Someone who did that. Right. Can't... What? That's a, it? They just stopped that being criminals? was their one time only? Yeah. I guess... Pretty Maybe. big shebang. Shebang? No. I yeah, shebang. The Sheboygan? I don't know what. Oh. Um, listen. Just, you know. I don't know the difference between a shebang and a Sheboygan, but I, I bet Shibu- there is one. <laughs> I think Sheboygan's a place. I see. I think. And a shebang is the whole thing. Yeah, the whole shebang. The whole shebang. The whole... The shebang in Sheboygan. There we go. Shit and caboodle. Sorry. Okay. I'm sorry. <clears throat> right. Fingerprints. There was no DNA collected at the scene because the only blood found in the house was Virginia. She had had a slight nosebleed and they determined that the blood was from her. 
Um, the case continues to haunt investigators who spent decades searching answers for this. Uh, state The SBI, State Bureau of Investigation, um, uh, one of the investigators, Charles Whitman, who was put on the case in 72, says to this day he hasn't the slightest idea who did it. He doesn't even have, like... An inkling. Yeah. He hasn't... He's, like, there's no theory that he feels confident in whatsoever, which must be so frustrating. Um, at one point, they actually did have a suspect who confessed to the murder, and they were like, okay, he did it. Like, he confessed to a cellmate and everything, and this all seemed great until a slight problem arose. Um, well, a few problems. First of all, he was in prison when the crimes were committed. Um, and secondly, he claimed, they said, how did you kill them? And he said, I shot all three of them. And they were like, okay. well, okay, well, I don't know you're, why you're doing this. Um, so, obviously, that was a dead end. Um, pardon the terrible pun. Uh, theories to this day, like... You know, I went in the Reddit rabbit hole and theories still exist or still abound and facts about the case still don't seem to add up. Um, For example, according to Watauga County Sheriff Len Hageman, quote, the fact that three individuals were killed all at once together is rather unique. This coupled with a very limited information trail as to a possible motive, plus a horrible night weather wise and the unusual length of time to commit the crime versus a quick in and out homicide just doesn't add up. Uh, he also wondered whether there was a reason uh, why the killings had to be done that night because he's like, it just seems so inconvenient that like the night of this massive storm that you would right. go out and kill someone and then like the car <coughs> doesn't work. Like you don't know if you're going to be able to get out. It just seemed like he said maybe it had to be done that night for some reason. Interesting. Um, but they're not sure why that would be. Okay. Um, and also why there was no sign of a struggle in the bathroom. And that was kind of creepy, too, because there was not one drop of water on the floor. So, like... Yeah, it's, like, almost perfect amount yeah, of water. Right. And it's, like, overflowing still into the tub. But, like, their heads are all three in. So they're, like, on the ground. Like, their heads submerged. And not one drop of water has spilled, which, like, is very precise and, like, carefully executed. And just... Honestly, seems very sterile. Yes. Yeah. Ew, yeah. Very creepy. Um, and the fact they ne- left no DNA or anything. Um, so that's the weird thing, too, is there was no sign of a struggle. So they must have overpowered them, like, really quickly. Um, except for the phone call. Seems to be the only thing that was maybe out of out of turn. Mm-hmm. Um, all these questions are obviously still unanswered to this day. Uh, of course, Reddit got me going a little bit. I went through some different theories on there um, right. as to what people think. So, uh, oh, by the way, just like most of the information here, I just wanted to point out is from the Watauga Democrat, the Winston-Salem Journal, Yes Weekly, UnexplainedMysteries.com, which actually, this is interesting, they featured scans of the original like article uh, written by Jay Etman. The publication on it isn't clear, but it's like from that year. um, And it has like this full telling of like, to the minute like what happened that day that's how i knew about like the car the conversation in the car with the daughter and like all of that stuff was in there so thank you to them for somehow having scans of this like 1970 document Mm. um and then i went to reddit so on reddit (laughs) as you do as you do always in the middle of the night um so one of the theories that like you know seems to often be like an obvious one is that they were on drugs or this was drug related but this like is pretty discounted by most experts on the case because like we said it's so precise and sterile and like careful and someone who were acting erratically right probably wouldn't have been able to pull this off so cleanly um some people still believe that the green berets had something to do with it that the military did uh, according to Whitman, some people were insistent that the way the victims were hogtied was the way the Green Berets actually killed people in Vietnam. Interesting. Which is an interesting connection, but obviously still just speculation, um, but is kind of a creepy fact. Um, one pretty obvious theory is, uh, like, again, a botched robbery. Uh, and that makes sense. In some ways, they did steal stuff. Um But in other ways, it doesn't make sense. For example, according to Whitman, when you first come in, things are chaotic. It has the appearance of a burglary. But when you stand back and sort of look at it with an experienced eye, if you will, the whole thing was staged. I don't know why, though. Um, So they found some silver in the abandoned car. There were much more valuable items still in the house, like obvious items. It wasn't like they were hidden or anything. It was like the bag of cash was just sitting there. Right. Um, So a lot of stuff, it just didn't make sense. It looked staged. Another theory is that this was a contract killing. Um, It makes sense in a lot of ways that, like, somebody who was good at killing or did this for a living 
perpetrated the crime and someone else paid them off to do it. But at the same time, you're like, why are they going after the whole family? Like you think maybe they were going after the dad or something if it was like a shady business deal. Um, but it, yeah, so it was all three of them. And the Bobby Joe, the 19 year old, was actually the one who was killed first. They found a he really, was, yeah, he was placed in the tub and drowned first. I didn't expect that. Me neither. I don't know why. I don't because it seems like why go for the kid first? You, you know, could, to kill him first makes me think that he was the one you de- the, the definitely target. wanted. Yeah, right. But you would think that he was just like collateral damage because the dad pissed someone exactly. off. Exactly. Because he's 19 too. So it's like. Maybe it's because he was the strongest. Uh, actually, that was one thing that people did say is that he um he was like very like strong and bulky and like he might have been the most. Maybe it was like get rid of the biggest threat first. Right, right. Could be. Yikes. But either way, like somehow this went down and it doesn't add up. Um, They don't know like if he was the target, if he got in the way, if he was right, like the most dangerous um whitman also wondered why was it necessary to go through all this trouble if it was going to be a contract killing uh it would seem that you would go in and bang bang and strangle well you know okay as you That's do sensitive <laughs> yes right uh i think this guy's like over sensitive like over being sensitive he's yeah like, um he says you go in and do the job and then you leave i have found this to be significant there was not one drop of water on the floor outside the tub which means none of them floundered around none of them resisted a great deal after they went to the tub and two of them weren't even dead yet. So it's just very strange that this was pulled off so smoothly. Um, Reddit also dives into a theory that I had actually considered but never saw anywhere in any sort of, like, reporting. Um, and so I was kind of excited to hear that, like, people were discussing this. Okay. Um, and that is that Ginny and Troy had something to do with it. Really? That's another theory. And that was my... I hadn't even thought of that. That was my first thought just because I was like... <sighs> You know, they're the only, they're the first people on the scene. You know, you always wonder, like, if it's close. And they got a phone call, but, like, right. maybe you don't have to trace that. Right. And it's, yeah. And, like, the um, the fact that, like, it was so, it seemed so personal and stuff, you know. I, right. I don't know. Um, but so this is kind of what, you know, I'm not saying there's any clear evidence, but this is just some things that maybe point to that. So. Um, the late sheriff that I mentioned earlier, uh, oh no, sorry, sorry, different guy, uh, late sheriff of Watauga County. He was one of the first officers on the scene. His name was Wade Carroll. He told the Winston Salem journal in a 1982 interview that he did not believe the phone call to Troy ever happened. Quote, in my opinion, Mrs. Durham never made that phone call. When some people come into your house to kill you, they are not going to let you make a phone call, which is interesting. And I'm like, I mean, maybe she got away, but also if they're this precise and clean it murdering three people systematically you'd right. think she wouldn't have the time to dial a number and call her daughter who knows i mean i think it's still possible but our pal whitman the sbi agent believes the phone call did happen um she's cooperated uh so Ginny has cooperated with him in the investigation and um he once took her to someone who put her under hypnosis and she apparently was telling the story of what happened and talked about the phone call but also again that's like but that's her story so Right, but at least it, like, takes, at least people can confirm, like, oh, she didn't do anything? Like, she wasn't... Well, she could be lying. Like, she could say, oh, yeah, we got a phone call, and, like, you know... Oh, I see. You know what I mean? Like, he said, oh, well, she says it was a phone call, and it's like, yeah, well, she could have said that. Either way, whether it happened or not. I don't know. Um, The weird thing, too, is, like, why did she call her daughter's phone number instead of the police? Right. That's a good question. Which is an, and they didn't have 911 back then, but all you dialed the operator and would say, you know, maybe she thought that emergency take services. too long. I don't yeah, know. perhaps. But also, you don't know if you're, they're going to answer the phone. Yeah. It just seems. And, and the stranger thing now, this is what I think, like, to me, this is where my first instinct was is why didn't they call the police? Like, why didn't Ginny right. and Troy call the police? There's this massive snowstorm. They don't even, their car's not starting. Like, yeah. Also, you would think they'd be a little frantic and mm-hmm. like getting there. Like if my mom said, hurry, like I'm going to die, I would be uh, yeah, freaking out if my car wasn't working. Yeah. And you know what? Another thing people talk about is like their car neighbors were like, they've never like this isn't they own a car dealership. This car has never had an issue. Like, it's just weird that their car would just suddenly stop working. Right. It had been cold all winter. Like it just seemed like an odd coincidence, which obviously, again, just circumstantial, like could have happened um and uh it, when they went to the neighbor's house they didn't even why didn't he say well did you call the pl-? or like 
Right. Nobody like thought to, apparently to call the police, which just seems strange, especially if your car's not starting and you're desperate. But even their neighbor wanted to bring a revolver. So you would right. think like this is dangerous enough that the police should be involved. Yeah, or you'd think you'd at least want to let them know before you head over, you know, like, right, like you can still meet go. us there. Yeah, exactly. Um, so that was odd. And then some other, other information, there's like this uh, article or this website called I did it for I don't know what that means. Um, and apparently after finding the Durham's lifeless bodies, Troy and Small didn't go straight to the next door neighbor to call the police. They hopped in the car and tried to drive away, but the car stalled in a snowbank. And when they at, were asked later, like, why didn't you? And then they ran back to the neighbors to call the police. And people were like, okay. well, why did you go into the car? Yeah. And they said, we just wanted to get away from that horrible scene. And it's like, sure, sounds but fishy. like, you need to call the police first. Like, yeah, I don't sounds know. fishy. It's just odd. Um, they just wanted to get away. And then they said when the car wouldn't drive, they went to the neighbor's house to call the police. So were they going to drive the half hour back home and then call the police? Like, it's right. just strange. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Um, again, like we said, the robbery seemed staged. Uh, this article in particular includes pictures. Okay, it does. It has all the, like the crime scene photos and stuff. So be careful if you're going to look. But um, one of the pictures shows like speaking. There's a coffee table. Speaking of which, you really played right into this. Um, there's a coffee table that tips over with a bunch of skittles. Yeah, <laughs> skittles everywhere. Um, no, there's a coffee table and it's like next to the couch. And there's like these. There's a glass. Um, there's like this uh, step stool that has been like thrown onto the coffee table, but if it had been thrown, like these glasses right next to it would have all toppled over. Right, so, so it, it looks staged. Yeah, it looks like someone literally just put it there because there's no disarray around it. Like it's right. just very strange that it. There's all these glasses and stuff, and if someone just hurled a large, it's like this giant stool. Like if someone had right. just like, hurled a stool onto the Something table, something would have broken. Yeah, yeah. So that was a little or bit fallen. odd. The picture alone looks like very strange. Um, Ginny, as for motive, inherited $250,000 after the death of her family, which today equates to about one and a half million dollars, um, which at least is a motive. I mean, not saying she did it, but if they're, if you're seeking a motive, that would be it. Right. It was well known the family didn't like Troy, uh, but at the same time, he was only 19 and it would have been difficult for him to overpower the family alone. So some people think, well, maybe they were the ones who hired someone. Got it. To kill them. And then they came upon the scene. Right. As, oh, no, witnesses, you know. Also, like, they were really brave to go into a house, especially after they saw a pool of blood. I'd yeah. be like, okay, I'm stepping outside and yeah. calling the police. Totally. Especially if you're like, do you hear that? And the TV's blaring. Like, uh-uh. But yeah. also, interestingly that you said that, because I didn't add this, but um, before they went to the garage, apparently cecil small lifted um troy up to look in one of the upper windows above the kitchen and he saw that the house was in total disarray so like he knew that going in so like they knew the house had already been turned yeah. upside down at that point he should have been like okay now we someone have to call needs, the police right someone needs to call the police asap um so that it's just odd like obviously again this is all circumstantial it could have been a number of things and these people could have just been like fully victims which you know not saying they're not but Either way, um, that's one of the theories on Reddit. Uh, But when investigators uh, took the case to an FBI profiler in 1982, so this is interesting, uh, the profiler told them that the perpetrator probably felt comfortable in the house is the way that he described it. Like, even though it looked staged like a robbery, he said, this looks like somebody who knew the house and felt comfortable being in it. So that's an interesting kind of idea. The profiler also gave them some disheartening news. Um, He believed that whoever had committed the crime would find it easier and easier as time went on to avoid confessing that over time, this person would have been able to convince themselves in sort of an out-of-body disassociative way that someone else had done the deed and that they were not responsible. So in other words, it would weigh less and less on their conscience as time went on. Right. So you get answers less and less likely. And the, the chance of a deathbed confession for example is probably unlikely if they're if they're talking themselves out of it right um so lo and behold despite all the theories the case is still unsolved to this day so very haunting and obviously since it is unsolved if you do have any information whatsoever you can call the watauga county sheriff's department with any tips information or leads they're still trying to figure this out still investigating any helpful leads and their phone number is 828 264 three seven six one 
not to be confused with rap, rap master. master. <laughs> I was going to say, and if you would like to get a rap. Yeah. <laughs> if you, there's one or the other option. Yeah, um, yeah. Solve a murder or. We're giving you a lot of assignments today. Yeah. You have a lot of homework. I'm so sorry. Um, anyway, so that's the story of the Durham family murders. Very gruesome. Very horrible. Yeah. And very creepy because really nobody knows. Yeah, it's weird that whoever did it might just be, like, walking around eating yeah. a sandwich right now. And I do feel bad kind of saying, like, oh, well, why didn't she... Like, you know, it was also, like, the se- early 70s. Like, who knows why yeah. they didn't also, call like, the police. Also, like, who knows what I would do in shock. Exactly. You never know how people are going to react to trauma. And I've heard she's since moved away and remarried and, like, doesn't really, like, obviously, like, to talk about the case. So, um, not trying to put any blame so on anybody. So, if she's a listener, I'm really sorry. I doubt it. Super sorry. But... If it's true, then I'm sorry. Um, I'm just relaying Reddit to you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, so that's all right. It. Well, thank you for that, Christine. You're so welcome. Thank you to um, uh, to uh, Rainbow Kitten Surprise Manager. Yes. I believe she calls herself Momager. Oh, thank you, Momager. I think it's kind of cute. Um, and uh, I'll bring you some, I don't know, let me know what you want. Some. I have some like fake lemons, some koozies um what else a skull with a bowling ball i don't know <laughs> don't take the skull i want that do you want some haunted dolls we have a lot of those christine sometimes i think like if you died what would i want to take from <laughs> would you inherit yeah i would uh, you almost said steal i heard it you're like what would i st- 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 take take, take. <laughs> well, i mean realistically i like to think that i would get first dibs on anything that's i in like here. to think blaze would be like can you just take all of it i don't i'd be like no i've never wanted a part in any of the haunted items there's at least there's at least a big chunk of things i would want to take there's a lot and i mean i mean whenever i move if i move like you're gonna need to take some of it because i ain't moving all of this to a new place that's the truth also i don't think you've ever mentioned that on the show except for facebook live what i said if i ever move if you ever move well (laughs) what oh i thought you had mentioned it before or hadn't mentioned it before what if you were to move oh well i mean i don't know i could move oh okay I didn't say when I moved. <laughs> oh, I said so I weird. said very casually, if I were to ever move. Gotcha. Well, now it's not casual. We're, I'm not moving, but it's possible. Not anywhere dramatic, just where the, our lease is coming up. We're not sure if uh, our landlord wants us to renew. And when I say coming up, I mean literally a year from now. So um, this is not any shocking Which is weird. It blows my mind that you've l- lived in this house for almost three it's years. It's the longest I've ever lived anywhere outside of like my own home. Yeah. I've never lived anywhere for more, this long. The fun part is if Christine does move, she might be moving like 20 minutes closer to me. I know, honestly, because I, we said it on Facebook Live for Patreon. By the way, they get all the weird fun facts first, I guess. But um, we mentioned it briefly. I was just kind of like, oh, and Kate, like it might happen. I don't know. Um, and I'm like, before anyone freaks out, it'll probably be a lot easier to do the podcast because yeah. she'll probably end up closer to me. I feel like a lot of people here move and then they think that like <laughs> nothing. the changed. podcast is going to come apart nice try we know you want it it's like it's like when i moved from glendale to pasadena right and then i moved again from pasadena to burbank you're moving like 10 feet at a time yeah i am next time i'll move like to you know somewhere somewhere and i just keep farther moving farther farther away making our lives more difficult so hopefully if we do move again i don't know if that's the case but you're gonna need to help me with this bowling ball and all this shit i'll take that for sure okay you know what's fun no that was a wedding gift to me you can't have that you know what's fun is when we uh first started the podcast we lived eight minutes away from each other idiots we're idiots i don't know why we ever either of us ever moved you're idiots anyway which was good for us because we were recording for like seven hours at a time (laughs) that's true like much like today yeah as the sun goes down anyway thank you guys so much for (laughs) listening kind of or turning this off yeah sorry five minutes in but also um if you are if you want to join patreon we forgot to tell you where i guess it was in the opening but uh www.patreon.com slash atww podcast and that's where you can sign up and you will get a secret code to get tickets early so that's actually kind of a really exciting deal for us we're excited to let that um be a little new reward yay yay okay so keep up um and then the sale will also go on soon and we'll post the code at, on our social media so at the pre-sale code atwwd podcast and that's why we drink drink a lot by the way <laughs>